I think that everything that we're doing here is obvious. It's like Einstein said, it was easy to discover the theory of relativity. All I had to do was ignore a few basic axioms. What are they? One axiom is that you should segregate kids by social class. We don't do that. You should segregate those who are trained to use their heads from those who are trained to use their, their hands. You should segregate those who are going to college from those not going to college. You should segregate the school from community, like the old citadels from the 1200s. Those are really old notions, you know? And so we just basically ignore all those things. And that's why when people say, oh, well, I don't know if we could do this. And well, it's a question of will. High Tech High is really a misnomer, okay? There's no course here in technology. So sometimes people think it's like ITT tech, you know, and, and it's not. And Tom Vanderark from the Gates Foundation once early said, High Tech High is a great liberal arts school in disguise. I've always loved uh, that description of it. Now, the purpose of technology is that they're tools, and the carpentry teacher in me feels that tools are sacred, and camera is a tool, just like a hammer is a tool, or, or a vice grip, or anything else, and they're really great things to know how to use, because when you know how to use them, um, you, can, you, can, you can make things, and do things, and demonstrate to people. If you want it wider, you, you divide x by, so like, 10. Ooh, that's perfect. Thank I... you. I found this image by Bastogot that I really liked, so then I kind of broke it down into all possible math, which I pretty much just, like, just isolated parabolas and cylinders. So then I wrote like a page of notes about it and then projected it on and made two different like compositions of my notes and then made the background. So I'm trying to emulate Bastogot, but also incorporating a bunch of math. Part of the proposition is this is a place where you're going to find out who you are. And art, of course, is a really great way to do that. So if you think about the history of the United States over the last hundred years, every time the country gets in trouble, there's an investment in science, technology, engineering, and math. It happened in the 1880s, it happened in 1917, it happened in the 30s, it happened with Sputnik, it happened with GI Bill, and it's going to happen again right now because of the circumstance we're in. The downside to that is that there's an emphasis on science, technology, engineering, and math to the detriment of the arts. For us, we just say, oh, science, technology, engineering, and math, fine. That's what everyone wants to focus on? We'll give it to you. But we're going to load it up with art and design and conceptual work that kids do because actually um, engineering and art are integral. Like standing on the head. Yeah, it'll work once we have our turning group. A few things that I think made this happen for me. One of them was that I was a single unmarried dad in law school in my early 20s and um, with a toddler. And I supported myself as a carpenter. And right after law school, to my mother's chagrin, I got a job teaching carpentry to working class kids uh, at the height of desegregation in the Boston Public Schools. When you're doing carpentry, you're making things and you're doing things. And it's really easy to, to, to put the math to put everything else in there. Like, why is a two by four, one and a half by three and a half? Kids really want to know that when they're sophomores. Well, basically, it's a lesson in capitalism because they used to be two by fours, and then they made the two inches one and seven eighths, and they made them one and three quarters, and they made them one and five eighths, and they made them one and a half. So if you look, if you're doing a retro of a house, you can read how thick the wood is, and you'll know when the retro was done. That's one thing. And then kids will say, well, why do they still call it a two by four? So that's capitalism. You get more amount of a tree, they call it a two by four, but it's one and a half by three and a half. So you can study. Um, you can study the world through almost anything, and I did that through carpentry. It takes about six weeks to build the robot. Uh, we don't just build the robot, we also compete um, as far as competition goes. Uh, everything that we do, we put it all into a document and we stand in front of the judges and say, look at us, this is what we do, this is, you know, these are our achievements, and we kind of like try and um, say, you know, like, we're the best, and this is, we want you to recognize that. Thank you.
we've had a thousand percent increase in girls this year, which was really cool. It's, it's a really enjoyable thing and it's definitely it's great because it involves us in the community as well. When you're in carpentry class or in automotive class or whatever class, you feel like you're doing, oh, this is what adults do. Now I'm finally in an adult milieu and, and so they've got purpose, they've got reason. That's what's kind of lacking in other settings. Then it's our obligation to, to, to get the math and the biology, you just pack it all in there because now you've basically got their attention. So you, essentially, you just, you just start with them. For me, construction, when I was doing inner city work, was really about urban planning high school, where kids are not specifically trying to become carpenters, but rather looking at the vast unmet needs within their own community, just like urban planners or community activists would, looking at the underutilized resources in their own community and then using the school at, and the carpentry class, for example, as a fulcrum where we're marshalling underutilized resources to meet unmet needs. So no, it's a, it's a social change agenda that you really get from doing this type of work. Uh, it's not about narrow skill training for specific occupations. It's not asking a 15-year-old to mispredict what they're going to be doing as an adult because because they don't know. A uh, hundred years ago maybe they did. If someone had told me when I was 15 that I would be spending my adult life in high schools, I would have ended it right there. <laughs> Because of carpentry, I really care about space. I've thought about space really a lot. And I'm accustomed to schools where the architecture gets in the way. And I didn't want a school where we were going to try to do things despite the architecture. So I love about this building is when you approach it from the outside, it's just a box. And then you come in here and you go, whoa. People say, this doesn't look like a school. I love to hear that. That's one of my favorite things to hear. They say it feels like a, like a, a, like a startup, like an incubator, uh, something like that. So that's why we have all this glass. Why do you have glass? We get to see what's going on in classes. Kids get to see what's going on with each other. And you get to look at student work. This is designed for exhibiting student work. This is about curation as much as anything else. So having kids present their work regularly gives us a benefit. And the benefit is, is that we all look at the work that the students did and say, oh, that was really good work. That wasn't so good. Not looking backward, looking forward. Next time, my work's going to be more like this work and less like that work. So we, so we needed a space that sort of lent its way to do that. So we have 40,000 square feet. Typically, you'd have 400 kids. We have 538 kids in this building, and it doesn't feel frenetic. And it doesn't feel hectic, right? And people said, oh, you can't have all this glass because the kids are going to be at the glass and fooling around. There's no one, there's none of that. And actually, instead of being in this little egg crate where kids can't wait to get out because they want to, like, go see somebody else, they see people coming by, and it's not a big deal. And also, we don't have adults' bathrooms and kids' bathrooms. That's not a small thing, that's a big thing. We just have bathrooms. So if you treat kids with respect, if you treat them like adults, if you enter them into the adult world, they will behave like adults. As Voltaire said, suspicion invites treachery. So it's basically founded on respect. People always say, oh yeah, but this, this is really great, but would it just work with, with purely with disadvantaged kids? And I say, well, what makes it easier for us and would make it easier for our country if, if we honored Brown versus Board of Education and we really had integrated schools. It's as advantageous for my kid 
to be with kids who are disadvantaged here as it is for the kids who are disadvantaged to be with my kid. And that's what it takes to create a society. That's the point of creating, because that's when Jefferson said, the purpose of public education isn't to serve the public, the purpose of public education is to create a public. But it would be disadvantageous because it's more difficult when you've got kids who all go home and no one at the table went to college. So here we get the peer effect. We've reversed the peer effect. I've got an example of that. I've got a dad who um, is a custodian at San Diego State who called me up and his son got a full scholarship to a very elite private college and is just graduating. And he called me up weeping a little bit and said, remember what you told me when my son first came here eight years ago? And I said, what was that? He said, you told me that he was going to be going to college. And I asked you what I needed to do. And you told me nothing. And you told me uh, that the peer, we'd reverse the peer effect. And, he, and the pressure, the social pressure here is, you're going to college, where are you going to college? So that makes it easier here than if we were, for example, right in the middle of Compton, where we only had the have-nots and none of the haves. And it's not because the haves are, are more, there's nothing more virtuous about them. It's just that this, it's, it's beneficial to have an integrated school. I think that public education is our most precious public institution. Everybody knows that education is the one intervention that can most elevate you above social disadvantage more than anything else, and yet it's the least changed public institution in American society. That's the paradox that we deal with. And I hope that we come to terms with it. I really do. We need to be evocative. We need to be midwives with teachers and find out uh, how they learned in high schools, what were their most memorable learning experiences? Draw that out of them. Ask them to write it down on a piece of paper. It was a project. It had a mentor. It involved community. There was risk of failure. There was recognition of success. There was a public exhibition. So, well, this didn't come from the central office. This didn't come from the state legislature. We just asked you how you learned best, and you are describing precisely what we think would be a really good idea. How, respectfully, I would like to ask you, does this comport with the way that you teach? What's stopping you? from doing this, come from within and, and go out. And also ask teachers and work with teachers if I, as I have in traditional schools. So what do you love to do outside of school? Oh, that's what you love to do? Bring it in, integrate it, integrate it. As Hegel said, you could argue from any X to any other X in the universe. We can connect what you really love to do with the subject you need to teach, then you'll be more passionate. I mean, it comes to a definition of rigor. I think one misapprehension of rigor is that it's more content. A more nuanced uh, misapprehension of rigor is that it's increasingly complex content. I would argue that rigor is being in the company of a passionate adult who is rigorously pursuing inquiry in the area of their subject matter and is inviting students along as peers in that adult discourse. That's rigor. That's why I say to teachers, you want to know how we know whether you're a good teacher or not? The sophistication of your kids' work. If your kids are producing work that's worth doing and that has lasting value and, do, and learning that's worth learning, you're a good teacher. You can see somebody getting in a bus. So I'm for I want kids behaving like an actress, behaving like a scientist, behaving like a documentary filmmaker, behaving like a journalist. Not just studying it, but being like it. Because really, what is adolescence but trying on new roles and sampling new identities? We're just giving them a chance to do that.